Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. How are you? My name is Gary Fowler, and I'm the CEO, President, and Founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios, a premier AI and quantum venture studio located in the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm a 17-time Sur entrepreneur with several unicorns under the belt. I was on the original management team of Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion and also Eva.ai, an AI HR tech company that I co-founded with Dr. David Yang. We believe at GSD, which is my company, that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but opportunities are not. With that, I've got an incredible guest today. So Larry Weiss, he's an experienced a microbiome executive with a demonstrated history of working in the biotechnology industry. He's skilled in research and development, U.S. FDA uh, chemistry, uh, protein chemistry and life sciences. And he's got a strong background in medical science because he is a doctor from Stanford University. And he's also got a Bachelor of Science from Cornell. So with that, I'd like to bring Larry on board. Hi, Larry. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Gary. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I got a question for you. Now, you went to Cornell. Was it cold up there? Uh, those are the four coldest years of my life. And <laughs> matter of fact, um, I'm going to date myself, but it was during the energy crisis. So not only was it cold, but they turned the heat down. I remember, and they used to have like alternating days for uh, gas. And you if odd and even based on your license plate. And so, yeah, I remember. I remember going up to Cornell. I think I told you this. Uh, had a girlfriend that uh, her father liked to go into Finger Lakes uh, sailing. And so we go up there in the June time frame, and uh, her cousin's up there with a big power boat. And I hadn't been up to the Finger Lakes in, in June and had this wonderful idea that would it be great to jump into water because it was hotter than heck out. And I hit the water. Uh, I was going to swim to the other boat that was next to us, probably 100 feet away. And I thought I was going to get, I thought I was going to die. It was that cold. And I swam and I had had a couple of bloody Marys and I'll tell you what, I've never awakened as fast in my life after that. And it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, but it was cold. True. Uh, that, that's the truth. Look, it's a fantastic school and got a great education there, but uh, that was kind of the end of my appetite for winter. And did you get to see Carl Sagan at all? I did actually, I took astronomy with Carl Sagan, uh, me and 700 other people. But this was, you know, before Discovery Channel, and uh, Carl was a inspired teacher, a brilliant lecturer, and also a pretty funny guy. Yeah. Um, so it was one of it, and and it's, incidentally, since you bring it up, there's the hotel school, and I took two courses there. One was uh, sauces with Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet. For oh no kidding! Days. How was that? Oh, it was fantastic. I still love to cook, and. Uh, the other one was wine tasting. Very popular class with a Wednesday afternoon lab. No kidding. I bet. I bet. So when you did the course, how was it to have a, was he a celebrity then, a chef or not? Yeah. No, yeah. He was, the hotel school had a number of these relationships. Um, you know, it's, an, it's again, and Cornell is an amazing school with amazing faculty who seem to have an endless appetite for cloudy skies and cold weather. Um, mm -hmm. but it was a, it was a great education. It really was, um, you know, when, uh, when my daughters were, uh, my, I raised a couple of artists when they were going to school, what I told them to major in was great professors. No, that's great. And did they go to Cornell? No. Um, one of the, my older daughter, who's a cellist, uh, went to uh, rice and then got her doctorate at Juilliard. And uh, the other one, who is a writer, went to Colby and then got an MFA at um, Columbia. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting. So how does this question, how does Cornell rank itself compared to the other Ivy League schools? Where do they place you, it? <laughs> you know, um, that is a that is a artifice that has been developed to make people feel bad about other people and good about themselves. Uh, you can get a great education at a school that doesn't have that type of, you know, reputation. And if you work at it, you can get a crappy education at a great school with great faculty. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's much more expensive than it was when, you know, when you and I went to school. Yeah. And, and uh, my recommendation to everyone is um, be an astute consumer of your education. Make the most of the time that you have there. Uh, find great teachers, spend time with them. 
um, and then follow the engine of your interest wherever it takes you. No, that's great. So let's get down through. So, you know, you went, so when you went to Stanford, you, you, did you ever practice as a doctor or? Cause oh, I, I did. Um, yeah. Uh, internal medicine and then uh, anesthesia and intensive care. Uh, I was an academic at the university of Arizona for a couple of years, um, left the practice of medicine in the mid nineties. There were a whole lot of things happening in medicine at the time, um, that, uh, have brought us to the place where we are right now. Um, we could spend a whole hour on this, by the way, but, uh, we took medicine, which should be a right and a profession where the primary, uh, uh goal is your patient outcome. And uh, during my tenure, we turned it into a business, which turned doctors from being professionals into being employees. And uh, the primary incentive is incomes. Uh, and by the way, we got exactly what we asked for, which is we now spend more and live shorter, sicker lives than every other developed country in the world. This is one of the things that has taken me from what I was doing in the practice of medicine, which was fixing things that were broken to asking mm. the question, why is there so much broken stuff? Evolution doesn't produce a species with the burden of disease of an industrialized modern homo sapiens. Um, we did that. And, and anyone who was paying attention back there starting in the late eighties, eighties and early nineties was noticing that the incidence of inflammatory disease, has started to increase and it has tripled in the past 30 years. Today, 60% of us are on medication for one inflammatory disease and 40% are on medication for two. And there is now a new diagnosis called multiple chronic conditions, which is three or more and 25% of Americans, men, women, and children qualify for this diagnosis. Um, and while we're spending 22%, I think, of our GDP on health care, we're spending next to nothing asking the important question of um, why are these diseases increasing? Uh, if you turn on your TV, in five minutes, somebody is going to tell you you need to be on some biologic anti expensive biologic anti-inflammatory medication, probably for the rest of your life. Um, and we passed the milestone recently of spending a hundred billion dollars a year on these medications. Um, I think we deserve better. I think, you know, and, and I, and I don't know about you, but I know the healthcare, I was looking at, you know, for my company, the healthcare insurance policies. I mean, you're talking about for a family now could be 2,300 bucks, 2,400 bucks. I don't know how in the world. And that was this year. What's going to be next year? You know, I, I had 1,700. It was 2,300. How in the hell does it get to a point where people just say, I can't afford it anymore? You know what I mean? I just can't do it. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, this is um, so many of the places we are is about how we got here, not where we should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the healthcare system that we have right now um, is, again, it's based on incomes and not outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the cost not just of drugs or a hospital visit or an ER visit or anything, but of everything. And then the inconvenience cost of people who don't get care that they need until it's too late, either because they don't have insurance or because it's so inconvenient to get seen, uh, then those things multiply. Um, as I said, we, um, this is the wealthiest country that's ever existed um, and we as its citizens deserve decent health care and not just the disease care that we're getting, but actual health care, which is going to get us into, you know, something that I knew we talk about, which is uh, what exactly do we mean by health? Uh, I used to have a talk, the title of it was, um, how can we talk about health care when we don't understand health and we don't care? Mm -hmm. um, and so... For most of us, you know, we'll maybe see a doctor every year or so for screening physical, uh, but a lot, many don't, and they don't have the coverage for it. And then um, when something goes awry, uh, it starts to get very expensive. And as you know, the number one cause of personal bankruptcy in this country is uh, 
uh, is disease and healthcare. Uh, as I said, we deserve better. We have some of the smartest, most dedicated physicians in the world, in this country, trying to do the best for their patients and swimming upstream in a system that is dangerously outdated. Yeah, what's the answer? Um, well, the answer is single payer. Like every other, every other civilized, um, industrialized country in the world, uh, they recognize that how do you build national wealth? And it's got two huge pillars. One of them is education and the other is healthcare. If we make education and healthcare much more readily available, the doctors are graduating from medical school today with half a million dollars in debt. Uh, that means the selections they make about what to do with their time afterward are heavily influenced by that. That's not healthy for any of us. Uh, these numbers haven't changed very much in the past 20, minute, 20 years, but um, two thirds of doctors, if they won the lottery tomorrow would quit. That should scare all of us. That was before the pandemic. So mm. many people were deeply traumatized and scarred by going through the pandemic that I'm sure that that hasn't gotten better. Uh, same thing with teachers. You know, We know how to educate people for the jobs of tomorrow, but we choose to continue to educate them for jobs that won't exist. We know how to deliver healthcare efficiently, uh, effectively, to reduce the burden of chronic disease. Um, how do we know that? Because if you've got the money to afford it, you can get it. Yeah. But in both no, cases. I, so let's talk about, you know, so as your journey, as you've gone down through and, you know, you've been chief medical officer um, and you moved into this, this area, you know, the, the AO biome therapeutics, so what was that all about? How did that, you know, because it seems like you, you know, you went AO Biome as an advisor, then did the chief medical officer. What did you do? What kind of things were you working on? Um, so uh, to, to describe that, it's sort of this, you need to come to kind of look at the journey. So um, after I left, left practice, I got really involved in the emerging field of technology and wellness and health. And um Right around uh, 2000, there was a great deal of interest in infection control. If you remember, there were things like swine flu and, and things like this. And um, what became very apparent uh, was that people were bringing um, dangerous chemicals into their homes to disinfect or sanitize them. Um, when, in fact, most people don't need... Um, if you, do not, if you don't have a compromised host, a sick person living in your house, household, then most of the antimicrobials you need is just soap and water and decent hygiene. Um, but because everyone was terrified by what was going on, uh, what they started doing is bringing dangerous chemicals, chemicals triclosan, uh, benzalkonium chloride, triclocarbon, into their home to solve a problem they didn't have and create a problem that they didn't need which is those chemicals have an impact on our health, um, much more than the risk that they might be taking by not using it. Um, so the first company was uh, clean now. Right around 2000, um, we had developed these, these sequencing methods uh, to understand the sequence of DNA. And we, point, we pointed that at our favorite subject um, with the Human Genome Project, our us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found was that a substantial amount of us wasn't us. It was microbial. And as mm -hmm. that early data started to come out, it became very clear that we needed to rethink our relationship to the microbial world. Mm -hmm. We've been taught, we've been taught that uh, microbes are trying to kill us and germs are dangerous, but um, we live in a world where it's most of the life on this planet is microbes. And the microbes have been around for billions of years. Um, we are not the pinnacle of evolution. Uh, we are the spoiled and arrogant newcomers. We're the beneficiaries of these microbes, most of which are actually not just responsible for our health, but essential to our health. And as we cut the relationships with it, that had consequences. Uh, and so 
the uh, AO biome was built on this really interesting notion that we had lost a very specific microbe. It's called an ammonia oxidizing bacteria, and it, it converts ammonia into nitrite and nitric oxide, and uh, ammonia occurs on our skin. Uh, so um, we investigated what happens when you put ammonia oxidizing bacteria on the skin. And that would make it the first live topical probiotic. A probiotic is a live beneficial bacteria. A prebiotic is essentially the food for a beneficial bacteria. And a postbiotic is things that that bacteria make that might be beneficial. And just mm -hmm. to give everyone sort of common footing here, when we use the term microbiome, what we're referring to is the ecosystem of microbes associated with, if we talk about the human microbiome, it's us. And it's on our skin, it's in our gut, and it's in our mouths. And these are ancient relationships. Um, the big message from the microbiome today, and it's still a very, very young science, is that everything is connected. Most of those connections are ancient, and they are microbial, and they are a wellspring of our mm -hmm. resilience and our health. Um, I, um, I took this uh, parable from um, uh, David Foster Wallace, and I'm using it a little bit for this, but these um, two young fish are swimming along, and an older mm -hmm. fish swims in the other direction and says, uh, hey, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim along for a little bit, and one looks at the other and goes, um, what's water? And that's the world we live in. We live in a microbial world, but we can't see it. I can ask, what's the microbiome? The microbiome's you. You just can't see it or feel it, but it's as much a part of you as your skin or your, or your heart or your lungs. It's just, it's been invisible to us. You know, what does it do for us? Well, we're just starting to learn this, but it protects us. It actually it provides significant metabolism for all sorts of things we can't do ourselves. Uh, there are things your, you know, your readers, your listeners may have heard of called essential amino acids and essential fatty acids and essential vitamins. And uh, these are things that we need and don't make for ourselves, which often begs the question, uh, if they're so essential, why don't we make them? Mm -hmm. And the answer is we never had to. They were already on the buffet that had been prepared by all of the life, mostly microbial, that had come earlier. And as we cut those connections, we lost whatever the benefit was that they were providing us. So AOBiome was, here's one micro. But in the course of doing that, um, the question of, well, were these actually part of our skin microbiome before? And if you want to answer that question, you need to find some humans who still live a traditional lifestyle as a hunter-gatherer. That's very easy to say and very difficult to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And over the course of do, doing that, I met uh, the young man that you and I were on the phone with the other day, uh, mm -hmm. David Good. And David is a remarkable individual. His father was an American anthropologist uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, he was on a graduate program to understand the nutrition of the Yanomami, which are a, uh, um, a, tri a community of um, hunter-gatherers living deep in the Amazon, uh, many of them uncontacted or minimally impacted. So it started as a nine, uh, or a, sorry, a 12-month graduate program, ballooned into almost 11 years in the jungle. And during that tenure there, uh, the head man of the village betrothed his sister to him, uh, as one does. And uh, he married her. And David is the oldest child of that marriage. And he reached out to me one day. Um, he grew up mostly here in the U.S. and said... Um, but that must have been fascinating, though, right? Having uh, that kind of a dual life. I mean, that had to be... His father had to be a very uh, brave man. I, um, I urge you to have him on because uh, I can tell his story, but not like he can. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'd love that. Uh, so a little background on the Yanomami. Yanomami hunter-gatherers, they're also horticulturalists. They grow things like manioc and plantain. Um, but they've been living sustainably in the rainforest for at least 12,000 years. Um, they are um, they're pre-literate people. They don't have a written language. 
uh, which means that the elders are the library of their culture. Um, and uh, they don't count time. In fact, their counting system is just one, two, and many. But what makes them very interesting is two things. One is they live a disease-free life. All the inflammatory diseases that we have today, and that includes things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, these all are inflammatory in their, in their nature. Those don't exist in this population. And their skin, acne, eczema, rosacea, psoriasis don't exist. But they also have the most diverse microbiome in terms of the species that are on their skin and the metabolic pathways that are in the, that these, uh, this ecosystem have of any humans that have been measured yet. Um, and we have been studying them for about six years in this company. And uh, it's not just one bug that we lost. It's 80% of the, of the microbes that were part of our evolutionary legacy are gone. And it's, again, it's not just those specific microbes. It's what were they doing for us? So you can look at the microbes and you can look at their metabolic pathways and their function. And 25% of the metabolic pathways that we evolved in are gone. Wow. If you can imagine when you lose things like that, what you lose is your resilience, which brings me to what do we mean by health? So anyone today asks well, what they mean by health will have some, a definition of something like not being sick, or at least that we know about. Um, and the notion of wellness is the idea that I can change my behaviors in ways that will forestall the inevitable onset of disease. But what if I were to tell you that 90% of the time that Homo sapiens were on this planet, those diseases didn't exist. And I often get asked, what's their life expectancy? And as I said, the Yanomami don't count, but there are other hunter-gatherers still living a traditional lifestyle. And it appears that their modal age of death is about the same as ours, our mid seventies. If you look at the life expectancy at birth, it's lower. Um, but that's almost entirely due to infant and early childhood mortality. And that's what you get for being a bipedal primate. So we have created the, uh, together with David, we've created the most complete um, uh, survey of what a biologically intact human microbiome look like. This isn't the only one that ever exists. It's just the one that we have been able to survey what were the microbes that were there? What were they doing? And we're starting to look more deeply into the metabolomics. So this becomes a reference point. This becomes a reference point for a human population that doesn't have an inflammatory disease and has an intact microbiome. Wow. Uh, and then we, and then the important question is, well, can you translate that learning into something that makes a difference in modern life? And this is what we've spent past couple of years doing, and uh, we have found that the best way to do it um, is not to try to put the bugs that we're missing back, because we live in a modern world. They will be gone almost immediately. But identify what they were doing and create ferments with these bugs, with materials that mimic our evolutionary trajectory, uh, and replace what they were doing and put those into products that are people are familiar with using. So for example, we've started with skin. Uh, and so we have built ferments that replace much of what is missing and use those <coughs> ferments to make a unique line of skincare products with the intent of restoring the lost resilience. Um, but we also have data on the gut and on the oropharynx, the mouth. And how much different when they put on this, uh, you know, these um, biomes on the skin, what does it do? Does it rejuvenate the skin or what does it do? So um, this is an active area of uh, investigation right now. The first thing that became very clear is it improves people's appearance, which you would have to do if you expect people to use it regularly. If people don't see something that's meaningful to them they will stop using the product. And when you don't use and when you don't use something, you don't get any benefit. But I want you to think about it this way. And this has kind of been a traje trajectory of my career for a while, which is 
many, if not most of the products that we love and buy um, have adverse effects that we tolerate because we love the product. Well, you know, I'll give yeah. you, you know, if you walk down the center aisle of the grocery store, you can see the future of chronic disease in this country. Um, now, uh, these adverse effects from all these products, and whether it's skincare or anything else, is that we don't have a way of understanding what happens if you use a product day in and day out over years. And what, how does that impact uh, whether it's beneficial or not? So yeah. what we've done is sort of reached back into time for things that we essentially co-evolved with. The word symbiome, it's the name of the company, the word symbiome means co-located, co-evolving microbes. So it's not just that they're honest, we're evolving together. And it's not just we're evolving together, but we evolved together throughout time, to, which brought us here. So we're reaching back in time and say, how many of these things can we reconnect? The second thing that we are finding is that the benefits of this show up sort of across the ecosystem. And we're seeing this in the gut too. If you start and if you add fermented food to your diet, your gut microbiome is going to be healthier. You will reduce the inflammatory biomarkers. You'll increase the gut diversity. Uh, fermentation is the connective tissue of life. And so we're finding more and more is if we can do a gap analysis in terms of what did we used to have? What do we have today? How much of that can I replace? And then mm -hmm. ask the question, what are the long-term health benefits? And that's an active area of investigation for us. Interesting. And listen, we're, um, we'll have to do a tar part two in this. We got about five minutes left. So, um, so went quickly. Yeah, it went amazingly quickly, unfortunately. But we can do a part two. But tell me, um, number one is a summary. And then how do people get a hold of you if they want to reach out? Uh, summary, um, I think that we all need to start asking the right questions about the decisions we make, about which products we're buying, what we eat, and try to inform that by, um, by real understanding. And to do that, we have to recognize that today it's a young science. It's transformative. You know, you've heard me say this once too, but I'll repeat it for people who haven't heard it. The life sciences today and that includes this, is undergoing a revolution. And it's, we are where physics was a hundred years ago. So you can imagine these Newtonians watching this with their nice buttoned up equations, watching this oncoming chaos with Einstein and uh, just dismissing this as either wrong or irrelevant. In fact, they wrote a book called A Hundred Authors Against Einstein, uh, to which apparently his reply was, if I'm wrong, why do you need more than one? Um, and it's not that what we did before was wrong. It was just a small part of a much larger, more dimensional problem. And this is where we need to go with our decisions because it's not necessary. It's not obligatory that the products we love have adverse side effects. In fact, if we make health a primary design parameter, we can make products. We'll buy them and use them for all the same reasons we do today, but they'll make us healthier. And that is the ambition. And I hope to inspire all of the listeners here. Whatever it is that you're doing, it has an impact on human health. Try to understand what that is and design into your product health. And we will all benefit from it. No, that's fantastic. And what's the best way for people to get a hold of you, Larry? Uh, LinkedIn works really well. Um, and um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. All right, super. Yeah, we'll have to have a part two. Larry, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me today. It's just fascinating. And and we'll have to do a part two. And to all of you out there, uh, check out uh, Larry's LinkedIn profile. Check his um, company out, Symbiome. And um, it's just amazing uh, ideas and and we are, we've lost a lot. You know, you look at it as you're right. You walk down the aisles of the grocery store and there's a lot of garbage, probably 90% of it is garbage in the store. So we need to figure out how to eat better, how to live longer, how more healthy quality lives 
so that we all are fulfilled. And this has to be democratized. It's not just about here in the U.S. It's about the rest of the planet doing the right thing. So for all of you out there, I, I like to say stay happy, stay safe and stay healthy. And I'll be back to you again on Thursday with another exciting edition of GST Presents. Thanks, Larry. And thanks, everybody. Take care of yourself. Thanks for inviting me. Let's all get healthy together.